Uh, my name is Rob Wanzi, and I'm the senior fellow at the Arab Center, Washington, D.C., and I'm pleased to be with you to moderate this uh, uh, morning uh, discussion. As many of you know that the Syrian conflict, which began in March 2011, has created one of the worst humanitarian crises of our time. Or some of the scholars, they call it Syrian crisis, the tragedy of our times. Hundreds of thousands are dead. Uh, even the UN cannot keep counting, uh, as it says. Uh, and more than 13 million Syrians are now refugees or internally displaced, which most third of the Syrian population. And we have up to 128,000 forcibly disappeared and more than uh, 14,000 of them killed under torture. As of today, we have 11 million Syrians need humanitarian assistance, and 80%, or according to the UN, more than 91% live in extreme poverty without access to food, safe water, or healthcare services. And of course, above all of that, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated uh, the blight on the Syrian people. About half of the people affected are children and who are impacted by the lack of education opportunities and the oppressive practices of child labor and child marriage. I have with me a distinguished group of academics, practitioners, and scholars who will examine the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Syria with the urgent need for political attention to the conflict there. Uh, speakers will discuss the realities of everyday life for millions of Syrian refugees and internally displaced persons and what they need from the international community. The panel will also offer policy recommendations for the Biden administration and other international actors to help alleviate the massive suffering and the end of the 11 year old conflict. Will every one of the speakers will have his opening remarks about 10 minutes for each of our panelists. Uh, then we followed by question and answers Q and A with, with the audience. You don't need uh, to wait until the Q and A portion to submit your questions. You can use uh, the Q and A feature in Zoom to submit questions to the panel at any time, or you can email your question to events at Arab Center DC.org. Again, events at Arab Center DC.org. Now, let me introduce the, the panelists and the speakers. Uh, we'll start uh, with Mazin, Dr. Mazin Kawara, a close friend of mine. He's the Turkey country director for the Syrian American Medical Society, SAMS. He will give us an overview of the humanitarian crisis. The situation regarding the healthcare and the medical services. Next, uh, Muna Yakubian, who's been uh, know her for and her work on Syria uh, for a long time. She's a senior advisor to the vice president for the Middle East and North Africa at the United States Institute of Peace, USIP. Muna will discuss the humanitarian impact of the conflict and the US response and policy towards Syria. Third, we have Dr. Karam Shahar, he's an independent consultant, and we are really thank, uh, thank, uh, thankful to him. He's joining us uh, from New Zealand. There's a very early time there. Thank you, uh, Karam. He's a research director at the Operation and Policy Center. His remarks will focus on the economic conditions, political economy, international aid, and the politics of aid. Finally, we have Lena Attar. She, uh, she's the CEO of the, and the founder of the Karam Foundation. And I recommend everyone to visit the website of Karam Foundation. It's doing a an, an fantastic job uh, in, in, in that's the much need for the humanitarian need. Lena will highlight the conditions of the Syrian refugees and children and the impact of lack of education. Now, uh, let me start with uh, turning the mic into Mazin to give, uh, to give us his uh, opening remarks. 
Mazin. Hello, thank you, Dr. Rudwan, and thank you, uh, uh, everyone, for attending this uh, very important uh, uh, event, and a very big thank uh, for, for this invitation. Uh, I will just uh, uh, give you uh, a little bit new uh, figures related to the uh, uh, humanitarian situation in, in Syria based on the HNO humanitarian uh, uh, needs overview of 2022. So it's just uh, uh, published uh, two days ago. So unfortunately, the people in need right now in Syria uh, uh, are more than what Dr. Rodwan uh, uh, mentioned. For this year, we have 14.6 million people in need in, in, in Syria. Yeah. So, so we have uh, uh, 14.6 million people in need in, in Syria. At least the 22% uh, percent from the whole population, uh, Syria population, are in need, uh, uh, in extremely uh, in ex extreme need uh, uh, in 2022. Uh, I will uh, give you an overview about uh, uh, my remarks. Uh, which is related to the uh, 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 humanitarian and specifically medical situation in, uh, in, in Syria and specifically in Northwest Syria, where I'm operating and supervising the uh, SAMS operations uh, in, in, in this area. So according uh, to humanitarian uh, needs overview of 2022, uh, 20 million people are estimated to be uh, food insecure in, in, in overall Syria, equating to roughly 54% of the population. At least 2.4 million children remain out of school in 2021. Over than 2 million people living in, in informal uh, settlements and planned camps, 5% increase than 2020. Uh, about 97% price increase of average food basket between December 2020 and December 2021. More than 50% of the healthcare workers estimated to have fled the country. Only 65% of hospitals and 56% of public healthcare centers are fully functional. 30 attacks on healthcare in 2021 caused death of 25%, which three of them are our colleagues from the healthcare workers and five patients. Uh, 1,874 civilian casualties were reported in 2021. Six, uh, 636 of them are, were children. So this is a, a general overview about, uh, about the, 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 the humanitarian and catastrophe in, in Syria uh, in the last year. And we, I, I will go forward and explain to you the challenges we are facing in the healthcare uh, sector in, uh, in Syria and specifically uh, in the areas out of the government control. Uh, uh, and here I'm focusing on Northwest Syria. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is the humanitarian access. We have a problem related to the cross-border access, uh, uh, which was facing uh, a consistent decrease for two years. Uh, this year, there is a real risk of, no, of not getting an extension of the UN Security Council Resolution 2585. You know, uh, uh, in July, there will be uh, session for the Security Council, and we are in imminent risk, frankly, to lose the cross-border uh, when losing the uh, cross-border resolution. Linking the renewal of cross-border extension uh, with cross-line progress is a double-edged sword that we fear it might be utilized to affect humanitarian access. Cross-line access has to be principled and in a well-explained process which is not the case right now. Interference from parties to the conflict shouldn't control uh, which modality we are using. The Security Council is uh, politicized over this humanitarian issue, which is putting 4.7 uh, million people at risk 
from the most vulnerable population in Syria. Uh, there should be ways to avoid or mitigate the consequences of non-renewal of this resolution by investment in the alternative pooled fund. So when we, we, we lose the, the resolution, we will lose the pool fund of OCHA. Uh, the second thing we can do is supporting the localization agenda to support the local NGOs. Uh, third, uh, thirdly, engaging more with UN to ensure continuation of cross-border without the need to be affected by the uh, politically uh, divided Security Council. Uh, so the humanitarian access uh, 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 is in baddest situation uh, uh, will be if there will be no, 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 no resolution. The second challenge we are facing is COVID-19, frankly. So uh, uh, there is a new surge in positivity rate in Syria, which is 20% positive rate in Northwest Syria compared with 2% three, week, uh, three weeks ago. So what does that mean? Uh, now Omicron variant was already confirmed in Northwest Syria. The problem here uh, is that till now, the vaccination ratio is still very low, less than 6% among those who took just two uh, uh, doses. One of the lowest uh, ratio uh, over all the world, Northwest Syria barely made it out of the third wave. Uh, health resources were overstretched. Infection rate increased about 170% uh, compared with the previous uh, wave, which, which uh, 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 was less than, uh, than that. 100 occupancy rate was reached in the uh, hospital-based isolation units of COVID. Uncounted mo mortality were 1,852 deaths only in October last year. Preparedness to secure additional oxygen resources as well as vaccination and efforts to fight against vaccination is the top priority. More support to COVID-19 treatment services, including case management and community awareness and decreased vaccination hesitancy among the population is something very, very needed. The third, medical, uh, the third issue uh, related to the healthcare in this area is the medical education. The conflict has resulted in the uh, immigration of many healthcare workers. The effects on health in particular have resulted in many healthcare workers leaving the country. As, as a result, there is a lack of qualified Syrian medical personnel and a lack of specialized medical education. In long run, we need to find alternatives to recompensate the decrease in health staff. We can increase the community resilience in, uh, in health by by forming well-trained and experienced health, healthcare staff. We compensate uh, for the decrease uh, in the number of healthcare workers leaving the country. We need more recognition for the issued diplomas in this area and increase the chance for health education funding. We urgently need to invest more in health education. To increase the number of healthcare workers, currently healthcare workers are overstretched and we lack many of them in some key specialties, such as OBGYN uh, and cytology and psycho psychologists. So uh, uh, finally, I would like to talk about the funding of, the he of health in this area. Continued uh, limited funding for the health activities according to the uh, HRB 2021, funding function for health reach only 35%. 10% only in nutrition and 20, 28% for protection services. So very shortage, big, huge shortage in, in funding the healthcare services. Health infra infrastructure is destroyed after years of shedding. Old equipment, the medical equipment must be supported to be able to provide quality services. Existing medical equipment is also old and outdated. Due to the lack of the funding of, of health, organizations have had to choose between supporting the provision 
and continuation of services or maintaining existing equipment. We need to address long-term health needs that go beyond the scope of emergency care, including chronic diseases, specialized services like cardiovascular diseases and cancer treatment. We need more investment uh, in preventive medicine. Early detection of some serious conditions such as cancer could be in improved diagnostics, same applied to non-communicable diseases. Dental check programs and continued vaccination and EPI programs to uh, the improvement of surveillance of uh, uh, the health information system to collect and uh, analyze these are all very important programs in the longer term. So, uh, Dr. Rodwan, thank you so much for everyone. This is uh, my pre-prepared uh, uh, remarks related the, to the humanitarian and specifically uh, health uh, catastrophe in, in this area. And uh, four challenges we faced, we are facing and, and some uh, 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 proposed solutions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mazin. Thank you for this updated uh, information. And unfortunately, behind each number, it's a bleak, bleak picture. Uh, families, uh, and we see in the last uh, winter, uh, the pictures and the videos coming up from uh, the displaced camps uh, along the Syrian-Turkish border. Uh, but, but we'll come to that later. Uh, Muna, uh, the Biden administration put the humanitarian crisis in Syria at top priority uh, dealing with the Syrian policy. Uh, with the, all this, uh, um, unfortunately, this is in, in, in every bro uh, uh, prolonged conflict, the needs will increase and the interests will decrease. Um, and this is unfortunately happened with the Syrian now, it's the 11. Uh, we're going to the 12 years anniversary uh, ne ne next month. Uh, we'll uh, give you the floor, uh, Mona, to have your uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Radwan, and, and thanks to the Arab Center for the invitation. It's a really important topic. As you rightly note, Syria, um, certainly in Washington, is really not generating a lot of attention. And yet, uh, I think for my, the first point I'd like to make is that I think we're at a point now in the conflict where it, is the, where it is the intertwined economic and humanitarian crises that are now the most significant drivers of suffering um, and humanitarian um, uh, 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 hardship in, in Syria. Uh, I know Karam is gonna unpack much more the economic crisis. Dr. Mazin has spoke a bit about the humanitarian crisis. Let me say, I think it's important to underscore, in, at least in my view, that the conflict has really now settled into what I think will be a protracted, at times, violent stalemate. But in my view, the era of large-scale military uh, offensives and large-scale displacement is, is largely over. And so we are at this point where it's not violence per se that is driving humanitarian suffering as had been the case. It is indeed this humanitarian uh, crisis and economic crisis. To add just a couple more points to Dr. Mazin's laydown. I mean, first we know that in the last year alone, humanitarian needs in Syria have increased by 20%. And they are at an unprecedented level as he rightly notes. You have uh, poverty rates now estimated at 90%, two thirds of Syrians living in extreme poverty. The levels of food insecurity also unprecedented. Syria is now one of the top 10 food insecure countries in the world. Um, you also have, of course, the issues of climate and drought, uh, where I think Syria is now in the midst of the worst drought in the past 70 years. You're seeing crop failures in the breadbasket of Syria in the Northeast um, at an unprecedented rate. And you even have humanitarian groups warning about the collapse of both food and water provision across the country because of the combined effects. Um, and then of course, as you've noted, Radwan, there's also the issue of winter, winterization, the storms that have uh, besieged Syria and the suffering 
that goes with that because of inadequate shelter, because of extremely high fuel prices and, and fuel shortages. Um, and so I think that's the backdrop, uh, which I'd like to maybe talk for a little bit about US policy and then the recommendations that I would put forth. Um, clearly with the Biden administration, I think it's, it's clear that Syria is a lower priority. The Middle East in general is a lower priority. And of course, today, as we are contending with the uh, now start of another war uh, by Russia in, in Europe against Ukraine, um, uh, this is, of course, the, the, this land war now in Europe is going to be taking even more of the administration's attention. Um, so lower profile, you see it in terms of you don't have a high level Syria envoy, for example, uh, in the current administration. Um, it's also, I think, predicated on an assumption that Assad is here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, and so while the administration has been clear that it opposes normalization with Assad, it's not entirely clear um, how much political capital they are willing to expend to prevent countries in the region from normalizing. And we can go into that in the discussion. I'm sure many are tracking. We are already seeing a number of countries, Jordan, the UAE, Egypt, others, um, even potentially the Saudis, uh, reaching out to the Assad regime. So this is going to be part, again, of this backdrop that I think we have to contend with. From the Biden administration's uh, perspective, I think counter ISIS remains a key priority that defines its policy in Syria. As such, um, I think we should expect that the small number of U.S. forces that are in, in the Northeast, around 900 or so by some estimates, those will remain. I don't think we are going to see concerns as we did during the Trump administration that the, the forces could be precipitously withdrawn. Um, but I think that, that you see with the Biden administration a clear focus, and I would say rightly so, on the humanitarian situation on the deteriorating conditions for everyday Syrians. Um, so this is translated into several different measures. One is, uh, as Dr. Mazin noted, this cross-border uh, UN Security Council resolution of last July, 2585, a significant and important uh, achievement because it was the, we were facing the prospect of having no cross-border access into Syria because of Russian opposition. The US was able to negotiate um, for one year uh, the maintenance of the Bab al-Hawa crossing, which allows, again, this life-saving aid to cross into to Syria uh, from Turkey into the Northwest. So that, that's important. I'll come back to that, though, in a minute in terms of where I think things are going. So it's focused on maintaining humanitarian access. Um, the administration is also looking more intently at how to minimize the unintended humanitarian impacts of sanctions. And so you've seen efforts, for example, at issuing what is what are called general licenses, the most notable one for non-government organizations operating in Syria to allow for um, you know, the kinds of assistance and the kinds of interactions to take place that were not intended to be blocked by uh, the Caesar sanctions and other sanctions. So the administration is, is I think, really looking at uh, making sure that these unintended effects, uh, um, underscore unintended, are mitigated. Um, they're also looking at, and I'll come back to this as well, efforts at what's called early recovery. So this, is, this has to do with assistance that's not strictly humanitarian assistance, uh, but rather assistance that's looking to build up the resilience of local communities rather than emergency life-saving aid. That is starting to take possibly um, have a greater role uh, going forward. Uh, the other point that is often made by administration officials is that they are seeking to consolidate this sort of de facto ceasefire that I described at the beginning. They're, they're, they're looking to maintain that ceasefire, to build on it, to ensure that we don't see a resumption uh, of large scale offensives and fighting in Syria. And finally, uh, of course, the, the administration, I think, continues to focus on Iran and its posture uh, in Syria. Um, we've seen as tensions between the US and Iran ebb and flow, there have been at times an increase in attacks, including on American 
uh, bases in Syria. So that will continue, I think, to be an issue. We'll see what happens with uh, the JCPOA. There is discussion that uh, that negotiations that have been ongoing in Vienna may be nearing a conclusion and there may be a resumption or a, a rejoining of uh, the JCPOA. We'll see if that happens and to what extent does that have an effect on Iran and Iranian-backed militias in Syria. But that's certainly going to remain, I think, a big concern. And of course, Russia and deconflicting uh, US and Russian forces in the Northeast. This will be, I think, an important topic to think through and discuss what does Russia's current war uh, and invasion of Ukraine mean for its standing in Syria? What does that mean for the way the US addresses uh, Russian, Russian uh, forces on the ground in, in Syria? So I'm gonna keep this short and, and, and come to just some conclusions about recommendations going forward. Uh, first, I think it's very appropriate that the Biden administration is prioritizing the humanitarian situation uh, in Syria. I think it's critical to maintain, if not deepen that focus, precisely because, again, I think we are at this inflection point. We are at this time in Syria, um, this, I would call it, I've called it a cruel paradox, where violence, broadly speaking, is at an all-time low, but humanitarian suffering is at an all-time high. So focusing on how to assuage that suffering from a US policy perspective, I think is appropriate. Uh, several things I think the, U the administration can and should be doing. One is there is a fairly, or was a robust amount of assistance going into the Northeast of Syria, uh, stabilization funding. And that was working with local communities, helping to provide assistance and helping to retain and, and, and improve uh, living in those areas. Uh, that funding um, really needs to be maintained, if not increased. And the administration has signaled that it's interested in increasing maybe significantly its stabilization funding to the Northeast. I think it's, it, it, it's incumbent that that be the case and that, that receive the support of, of Congress as well. Um, of course, you have the issues that Dr. Mazin has laid out in the Northwest. And here, I think uh, we're really talking about the, the, the priority at a minimum of maintaining uh, the UN Security Council, the, the crossing at Bab el Hawa. My fear is that the current now uh, escalation in tensions with Russia may well jeopardize the crossing. And I think it's incumbent on the United States and others to begin thinking and planning now, as they have in the past, what to do. With, the, with that contingency, what to do if Bab el Hawa is not, uh, is, it, it is not uh, renewed. Um, and here I think, frankly, thinking through more creatively how to uh, manage assistance in the Northeast, coming into the Northeast, building better uh, ways of tracking assistance between the Northeast and the Northwest, something we don't do enough of, I think is something to, to really think about. I also think it's important to uh, consider, uh, again, this role of what's called early recovery and, and looking at more creative ways of building resilience, of taking humanitarian assistance and using it in ways that actually builds the resilience of local communities to be able to uh, 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 move forward on their own. Um, the issue with Syria, of course, as you noted, we are now entering soon the 12th year of this conflict. It's well beyond what would be called a humanitarian emergency. And so we have issues around donor fatigue, which are very real. And I think the pressures are only going to increase now with this war that is now starting in Ukraine. And therefore, I think it's important for the, the donor community, uh, for the humanitarian community and others to really think more creatively about how to take the scarce and perhaps diminishing funding for Syria and, and help think through how to make it go farther, last longer, build resilience inside Syria. One issue that is being discussed is whether is there the possibility in areas not held by the Syrian regime, so non-regime held, non held areas, to provide a general license for private companies uh, operating in these areas. This perhaps could build in or increase more economic activity, help to again to address some of this economic dislocation that is causing 
so much suffering. It's I think it's it, it's it's going to be difficult. I have no illusion about that, but it's important to, to think about that. Uh, and again, I, I also think more thinking has to be done on what else can be done to address these unintended impacts of humanitarian sanctions. It's tough, uh, but issues with banks, for example, and how to facilitate uh, Syrians that are providing uh, money to their families, Syrians outside Syria who are providing money to their families inside Syria. What ways can that can those kinds of efforts be facilitated? Because that it is truly, I think, a, a lifeline uh, for many Syrians inside. Um, finally, of course, I think it's important. There's been a lot of work done. I'm sure Karam is going to get into this, but the need to really insist that whatever assistance is passing through Damascus. Uh, that it be done, that it, it comport with issues around accountability and transparency, that the, the, this assistance is not exploited by the regime for its own purposes, uh, and that the assistance gets to actually where it needs to go. Um, I also think, two quick last points, I also think we need to think about similar kinds of issues with respect to accountability and transparency in areas controlled by Turkey and Turkish Turkish uh, controlled areas in the north and how is assistance flowing into those areas. Finally, and I know Lena is going to talk about this, but I would be remiss if I didn't at least notion, mention the, the, pre the precarious situation of Syrian refugees in places like Turkey, Lebanon, two countries that are going through their own economic meltdowns. And I think we're seeing that an already difficult situation for Syrian refugees in those countries is being made even more precarious. It's going to be essential that uh, UNHCR maintain its funding for Syrian refugees. And I think this is going to become more of a challenge, particularly if the conflict in Ukraine provokes large scale refugee flows there. Uh, and lastly, as the situation has has sort of calmed a bit in Syria, there is this increasing threat of forced returns by uh, of Syrian refugees back to Syria under the pretense that it is somehow now safe for them. We've seen this in Denmark in particular, very worrying concern of a, a pronouncement by, made by the Danish government that Damascus is now safe and it should be okay for Syrians to return. I fear that we're going to see more of that type of pressure. Um, and it's gonna be really important for the United States, frankly, in the lead and others in the international community to ensure against forced returns, which of course contravene international law with respect to refugees. Let me stop there. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Muna. Um, I absolutely agree that uh, the Syrian conflict became a bureaucratic uh, conflict, which has huge implications on the long term and on the short term, the short -term policy. Uh, we'll come to that later because we need to discuss the linkages between the humanitarian and the political transition, if there is any seriousness uh, among the Biden administration uh, on, on, on that. Uh, now I'll move into Karam uh, uh, to give his opening remarks. Um, I, I know it's, it's a hard job because now Syria under three different type of governance. Uh, each one has its own rules. And each one has its, its different type of suffering uh, regarding the economic situation. But I think you are the best one to address these. Kara? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I mean, I tried to prepare some uh, talking points here, and I thought I can just break them into three uh, parts. So the first is the political and economic conditions in, in Syria, uh, with a focus on where are we headed. Um, and the second is the politics and economics of aid, and finally, recommendations. Um, now, regarding the political and economic situation, obviously, we all clearly agree that it's a protracted conflict. Um, what needs to be highlighted is that the economic situation is, at this point, actually the worst since the beginning of the uprising, even though um, the military um, like violence uh, is at its lowest point, which might not make sense. But actually, if you think of the drivers of why we're here, uh, you, you realize that, yeah, that's it's kind of understandable why the situation is this terrible. Where at this point, I think 
um, like in, in, in such a bad place economically because of multiple factors, including uh, the Lebanese banking crisis, including the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, including family feuds within the Syrian regime, Bashar al-Assad and his cousin, uh, the tightening of US sanctions, um, and the worsening economic situation in the main uh, economic backer uh, of the Syrian regime, which is Iran. So I think if, we, if you look forward as to what's going to happen, uh, like what the, the outlook is, um, we co-authored, uh, like I co-authored a piece with uh, Nick Leal looking into this, and we're actually arguing that we might be headed toward a famine in, in Syria if current trends continue. And here we outlined three factors. First, the severity of the current drought. Some sources are actually talking about a drought that hasn't been seen in six or seven decades. Uh, according to EU official statistics, it's the worst in over 25 years. And you, you all remember how many people are actually saying that one of the main drivers of the uprising to begin with was actually the drought of the mid 2000s, which is partly correct. But now you're talking about a drought that seems to be far worse than, than the previous one. Um, for most countries, uh, for most uh, control areas in Syria, even though all economic sectors were, were negatively affected by the conflict, including the agricultural sector, uh, it's, it's actually the fact that the agricultural sector was least affected among them, and therefore its relative significance actually increased um, throughout the conflict. And so now, um, because of this drought, the, the, the outlook looks pretty bleak. Uh, the second factor behind a, a, the, a possible uh, famine is the low starting point. So currently we're talking about um, multiple factors, but statistics that uh, Mona um, highlighted, and yeah, I mean, we're talking about more than 90% of people living below the poverty line, and actually one of the scariest statistics for me is the one relating to where, uh, like whether people know where their next meal will come from, uh, and currently this is like, this is around 60% in, in whole of Syria. Um, the third factor, which I think is like explaining part of uh, what's happening and it's, it's where we can, I think, uh, put so much pressure is the decline in humanitarian funding. Um, and currently you're, you're basically seeing a, a level of funding that's the lowest since 2014, even though the economic situation and the humanitarian situation are actually far worse than uh, they were in, in 2014 actually even the population is is higher so even if you look at it in terms of in, in per capita terms um, you you see that there's a significant decline in humanitarian funding so if i move to my second point the politics and economics of aid um, uh, first just to put the numbers in in context if if you're just looking at un uh, facilitated aid to Syria, you're talking about 2.4 to 2.5 billion dollars since 2014 until now. The the total amount of money spent by uh, the Syrian government, for example, in in the budget over the past two years, like in each of the previous two years, is actually about the same amount, depending on the exchange rate you you apply. So people actually rely on on aid. Uh, for so many things they actually can do without it. Um, what's happening is aid is being stolen so clearly. And here, um, Natasha Ho published uh, a report, an excellent report last week uh, entitled Rescuing Aid. And I think if you think of stealing aid, you can break it into multiple channels, but one of them actually deserves more, more highlighting than, than others, I believe. So you have, for instance, appoint, appointing regime cronies, um, say for example, the wife of Faisal Muqdad, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, is actually uh, a consultant to the uh, World Health Organization, uh, helping with what? The psychological impact of the conflict. Um, uh, yeah, uh, th and the second point is, like the second channel is how the regime actually grants aid to loyalist areas more than other areas. 
Uh, and the third is contracting with regime cronies, how um, some UN agencies are actually contracting with people who have very strong ties to the Syrian regime. And obviously, I don't want to go too harsh on the UN. Actually, many people do not appreciate how difficult it is for the UN to operate in Syria. However, I think there is the part where they're actually forced to do what they're, what they're doing. But there is actually another part where they could do a lot better. For some cases, when it comes to due diligence, I understand, okay, it'll be costly um, to search for the backgrounds of every single contractor, but what about a, a Google search for, for those? Something, just, just uh, maybe 15 minutes uh, on each of those uh, contractors. Now, the fourth channel that I said uh, I think deserves more highlighting is actually stealing through the exchange rate channel, because this is where the Syrian regime is actually skimming off the top. Uh, this is where they impose an exchange rate that is far from the, the one prevailing in the black market that is determined by the forces of supply and demand, um, and, and therefore just do not pay uh, the equivalent in Syrian pounds uh, for uh, money transfers that end up in Syria. So when you're looking at the salaries of UN staff, for instance, these uh, currently the Syrian government takes a third of that money before the before UN staff are actually paid. This is this is currently the difference between the rate applied to those transfers and um, the the rate in the black market. I think here is where we should focus, we should campaign a bit more. Um, and uh, my colleagues, Munkat Al-Aga and Natasha Hall uh, worked with me on, on um, like an analytical brief where we calculated how much uh, the UN is losing because of this, just $60 million through this channel uh, over 2020. So uh, luckily there was a letter from uh, like the, the members of the Senate and Congress actually calling on the Biden administration to address this, this topic. Now, uh, the other part relating to aid, which is the politics of um, uh, early aid recovery. Here, I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, and my colleague, Sam Yaqid, and I uh, published uh, a policy brief last week uh, in the Atlantic Council on this topic. Um, and I think What's happening with early aid recovery is can be explained by two things. The first is the desire in the US administration to review uh, sanctions. And the second is uh, what happened in the Security Council with the latest renewal of cross-border aid. So where there was actually clear wording relating to early aid recovery. And what happened recently, uh, and here I'm referring to the easing of restrictions um, relating to early aid recovery in Syria, I think what happened recently is because of these two factors, not just one of them. Now, the US government is in a tough place because you don't know in such a situation, do you, do you provide early aid recovery and therefore um, strengthen the position of all warring parties, but primarily the Syrian regime, basically lower their willingness to negotiate. If you're, if you're uh, helping them rebuild schools, helping, helping them rebuild infrastructure, although maybe until this point, there's no talk about rebuilding infrastructure. Uh, but if you do these, then you're basically telling all parties uh, that it's not that urgent for you to sit and negotiate. But on the other hand, also for people living there, the situation is horrible. So you have to do something and you can't just keep on giving people money uh, to eat and a tent to live in. This just can't continue forever. It's been 11 years. And so in the long term, then you think that, well, early aid recovery, even though it would be helpful to people in, in the near term, even with the siphoning of some of that aid, it would be helpful to people a little bit, but maybe not in the long term as most um, actors, local actors, would be less interested in, in engaging in uh, talks. Now, this takes me to recommendations. And, and here, um, I think I want to first say that we need an increase in humanitarian funding in spite of stealing, because you can't now just say we will stop 
uh, and review what's going on. People, the, the situation is way too precarious for us um, to, to do this. And so I think we, we all need to be calling on governments to increase their contributions uh, to Syria, uh, while at the same time trying to come up with mechanisms um, and uh, publishing more research on accountability and um, investigating how the money is being spent, how aid money is being spent in Syria. And I want to say, over the past year or two, there has been some excellent publications in, in that area. So I think it's now a well-researched uh, topic. I'd say we need to review sanctions. Uh, we published, uh, a, I would say, a comprehensive review of sanctions last year. Uh, and I think there are some parts that I, some parts of sanctions, I will never understand why they need to be lifted because their impact on civilians is virtually non-existent. Uh, and this includes asset freezes of uh, war criminals. Uh, this includes uh, travel bans. However, there are parts that are definitely hurting civilians, and we have to admit that. Uh, this, I think, relates primarily to financial transactions. It's like targeting, uh, it's like having a problem with a body that is just the hand, say the Syrian regime or terrorist actors, uh, while all other Syrians are the other parts of that body, and then going and sanctioning blood, uh, blood circulation. You just can't do that. You're hurting everyone uh, with that. And we're, we're all hearing stories of Syrians suffering uh, from that, not only in Syria, abroad as well. So I think sanctions need to be reviewed. Uh, secondary sanctions need to be used a lot more frequently. Um, travel bans and asset freezes need to be used more frequently. I mean, I think the way sanctions are being imposed kind of uh, tells you that there isn't much interest in in Syria. It's actually have like one of the one of the reflections also with all the errors you see in those um, sanctions or the people who are being listed. Some marginal people are listed and some very important uh, actors are not. Um, the last thing I want to say is I think this is very important for a situation like Syria where it, it's a slow burn situation. Things keep just getting worse by the hour, but it's not like an earthquake or a volcanic eruption. And so there's not there's nothing newsworthy uh, to go and, and um, like shout about. Uh, and therefore, I think what we all need to be doing is to do exactly what we're doing here, just bringing Syria to the forefront again. Uh, we need to tell the world that, hey, this is far from, from over. Uh, and we can't just look look the other way. I think what happened basically um, in, in Syria is that for most Western politicians, uh, freezing the conflict and stopping it from spilling over into other countries uh, was politically cheaper than pushing for a settlement. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're just trying to contain it. So whatever happens in Syria is, yeah, sad. Um, sorry, it's happening to you. It's not. It's not us who did it. Actually, it's just Russia and Iran. But yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? Right. Uh, so long as no terrorism in in our countries is uh, happening, so long as no refugees are coming into uh, our countries, uh, so long as Israel is uh, safe. Well, maybe maybe it's not that urgent to push for a political settlement. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kamar. Uh, uh, Karan, you touched very important uh, point, uh, especially now the international community deal with the Syrian humanitarian crisis as someone else problem. Um, and this is someone else problem getting, uh, unfortunately, more and more in the minds of the policymakers uh, in, 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 in Europe and in the United States. Uh, where we list, as Mona mentioned, uh, where Syria now is the lowest in the priority uh, within uh, the Biden administration. Uh, despite of uh, all the senior senior officials has been involved in the Syrian crisis before, including, of course, Secretary of State Blinken, who was under the Obama administration uh, when the Syrian conflict erupted in 2011. I have too many questions to you, but now let's move into uh, Lena. Uh, uh, Lena, in 2014 and 15, we heard a lot about the lost generation, focusing on education, trying to secure. Where, where these promises end up? Because now we have more children in need of education and your organizations trying 
to fill a small gap, but it's still a huge uh, need, uh, 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 then the, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Rodwan, and thank you um, for inviting me today um, with the Arab Center, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, I have to say that I have I rarely do these kinds of um, speaking engagements over the past years because of my lack of optimism and hope um, in any kind of real political change, and I don't think those views have changed. But um, this invitation kind of I wanted to see I wanted to hear from this panel panel, and I highly respect everybody's work, and um, and I hope that things could be better in the future. But uh, today, I think I'm going to, after all of the really important data that we heard from everybody here across the sectors, I'm going to change a little bit how I'm approaching this and uh, talk about a different viewpoint and specifically talking about um, Syrian refugee children and the youth. And it goes even beyond just Syrian refugees and children, really it goes to all children and especially marginalized and uh, refugee children that are increasing every day in the world. Uh, before I start, I wanted to also say that my heart today is with the people of Ukraine. And as the daughter of Aleppo, I know exactly how it feels for your home to be destroyed in front of you and what and the and really the worries of the days and months ahead um, that could bring to and the destruction that could come to Ukraine. And so I do hope that they are spared from what the people of Syria had faced. But again, we find ourselves as it's very difficult to be in these cycles of, of, um, of trauma and despair because when the Syria conflict began, uh, we were hearing um, lessons from our Iraqi friends and we said, no, it's going to be different for us. And we found ourselves last year um, watching our Afghan friends go through their second cycle and then taking from what Syrians have learned over the past decade to talk about how to how to deal with displacement and uh, and refugees. So we're becoming one of the cycles of supposedly never again is really an illusion. And so a lot of things that Karam had mentioned about the UN, um, I am wholeheartedly agreeing with because um, while there are some things that not only really large agencies are capable of doing, they are capable of doing so much more and so much better. And we've known that for many years. But I'm going to switch the page and I want to really talk about um, Kedem Foundation's work and at using that as a basis of knowing from what we've done over the past 10 years on what really works. And I don't think it's going to be a big surprise to people, but what really works in this situation after the failure of the international community to, to create real change when it really mattered before all of these people became refugees and before the destruction of the country and the situation we are in today, which is really investment in the youth and investment in human potential even more than the youth. Um, I learned firsthand from growing up in Syria as a, as a young Syrian American who was, I was, um, I moved from Syria, from America to Syria, and I went to, through the school system and I went through the university system. And anybody, people on this panel who are Syrian know this, that when you're growing up in Syria and we're talking this way before the war, um, there's no real investment in human potential and there's no real investment of people uh, becoming free thinkers. And I learned that my own way. And I learned that from a point of privilege and a point of that I was American and I returned to America afterwards. So the work that we do with Syrian refugee children since I would say 2013 um, and very deeply since 2016 in Turkey in two specific uh, community centers that we run, um, one in Reyhanli, which is on the Syrian border in Southern Turkey and the other in Istanbul is that when you actually invest in the potential of young people, you actually can change completely the trajectory of their lives. You're able to create people that are sustain, able to be self-sustainable for themselves, their families, their communities, and their host communities. And we've seen these things happen with young people time and time again with the smallest of investments in the humanitarian aid world, it would it probably looks crazy because we're talking about approaching aid with the most generosity. 
and not just giving sprinkle of aid. It's not enough to teach people in camps how to read and that's our basis. It's not enough to take young people and say, all you can do is have these trades, whether they're labor, labor trades, physical labor trades, or even technological trades like coding. What you have to do is treat people the way that you actually want to be treated yourself and you, wait, you want your children to be treated. And with refugees and marginalized communities, you actually have to do more than what we do for our own kids. This is how much you need to turn around something as traumatic and as disruptive as being a child that has been displaced, witnessed violence, um, has, been, has been traumatized, is being bullied in their host countries, as we know, that's happening across Turkey, across Lebanon, across Jordan, and anywhere where our refugee kids are going to school, and how you actually kind of flip the switch of, from a refugee being something that defines you for life versus being a refugee as a circumstance in your life and that you're able to actually reach all of your other potential. And um, this is what we've been doing. So at Kerem Foundation, we do three different interventions at three different stages of a, of a young refugee's life. The first is with families to make sure that kids are actually going to school and that they are not in child labor. This is really important for refugees in Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan, where child labor and young marriages is prevalent. The second intervention we do is also um, caught through innovative education and really focusing on teenagers. So that lost generation that you talked about, Rodwan, we found that it's really happening in the ages 14 to 18. That's when a, when, a, when a girl is most likely to get married and when a boy is most likely to drop out of school and a girl dropping out of school. And it ends completely any kind of potential for being to get out of deep poverty and to actually create community change. And so we bring in kids to their Karam houses and we have a curriculum that is highly focused on innovation, creativity. And what we do is we're not giving people solutions, we're giving people skills. And the idea is, is that if these young people learn these world-class skills, and I'm talking about being exposed to maker spaces, exposed to writers, to creators, to actually opening up their eyes to, and telling them that your dreams are valid. What ends up happening is you end up with young adults that are being hired by, um, by whoever, whether they're you know, Turkish or host community employers, or they start their own entrepreneurial um, efforts because they have the skills and not because they are refugees. And that changes everything. And you teach them how to give back. Then the third intervention is trying to create as much access as possible for young people to be able to access higher education. And that is something that we focus on as well with our kind of scholars program. I wanted to just mention a few stories um, from these interventions that we've done. Um, one boy named Muhammad, I met him in Reh Hanle in 2015, and he was, he was a te young teenager working at a gas station. We went to his family and asked his family, this was our first case of Karam families, if we, were, if we give you a ca monthly cash stipend that is equal to what your children are doing and, and in their child labor, would you want them back in school? And as we know, so many millions, at least hundreds of thousands of Syrians and refugees that are in the host countries around Syria are lower to middle class families that lost everything and they, and, they, and they do value education, but they were in this circumstance, they had no other choice. And so we, we intervene with these families that value education, use them as our partners in this. And Muhammad was able to go back to school and right now he's studying mechanical engineering in university in Turkey. That's a complete, 180 degree turn. Um, a girl named Batul, who is from Northern Idlib, dreamt of being uh, an astronaut. She wants to work for NASA. I don't know if we're gonna go to get her there, but she doesn't see any kind of barrier between her and becoming an astronaut or working in space. And she's in university as well. She writes a monthly column about science and she's very interested in science. This is a girl who, was, when she's in Rehanle, she actually could, could hear the bombs bombing her village. Um, in northern Idlib and at the same time is able to pursue her dreams and is now in university and hopefully we're going to be able to get her through even higher education and get to her master's degree in science. And finally, Yusuf, I want to talk about, he is a boy we met in Rehanle and then he was, eight, and then he was at Kerem House learning 
um, how to create his inventions. He is from Wulta. He's actually a chemical weapons survivor with his family. He was in the basements in Wulta. He survived a hunger siege, as we all know. And he used to draw images and dream of building a better future and bigger cities um, in Syria after the war. And he is in Istanbul now. Now he's in university, but when he was in his Turkish high school, he noticed that computers inside his Turkish high school were not being utilized. And he created a proposal to his Turkish principal saying, I'd like to teach the, my, my colleagues the skills that I'm learning at Kerem House, which is to build 3D models. And he, he made these advertisements. He had four students sign up for this course. He actually printed their projects in the, in the Karam labs and took them back to school and created an exhibition. This was all doing this himself without any kind of guidance. And because the children saw or the kids saw in what he'd made, he was a, the, the semester after that, the principal said, you can do this again. He got 64 Turkish students wanting to take this course. He trained the four students to be his teacher assistants. They created a technology club in the school, which they'd never had before, nominated Yusuf to be the president. And now this Turkish principal was taking Yusuf around to the ministry saying, this is our Syrian refugee, look what he did. He started telling other kids in the Kerem house, his friends, how to do that in their own schools. This is something that's even beyond what I dreamed for these kids when we started these programs. I thought that we're talking about 10 years from now, what we can build. But this is a change that happened with a very small intervention, which is taking kids in and telling them you matter, the exact same things that we want for our children. And so our goal is to build 10,000 leaders by 2028. The pandemic has made all of this worse for Syrian refugees, especially with access to education, barriers to language, barriers to having Wi-Fi connections. So we have bigger gaps than we had before, but it's not something that we, can un we can't undo. And so I believe in this power of generosity, the power of intervening in, in a really big way, in spite of the failures of the international community, we can learn how to do better, but we have to take the different approach that the just giving the minimum is not gonna work. And we're not going to end up in a place that's better 10 years from now, when we have millions more Syrians and others that are living in poverty because they were never able to get access to the skill buildings that they need to take care of themselves and their families. And so I think I came to this place from a place of deep despair um, after witnessing really the failures of the Obama administration to intervene and stop this crisis when it could have been stopped a long time before. Um, but I actually think that by doing this kind of work, we can make real change and big um, partners in this, the agencies can actually create change with us in this way if we take this approach. So this is the message that I want to send to everybody watching. And, and I thank this panel for giving us the big view and know that we can actually create real change. Excellent, Lina. I like the most you started with a pessimistic view and end up with a very optimistic story. Uh, the success stories, uh, that's the one we need to focus on. on uh, and I think your work and your organization work is a testament of the work of the Syrian civil society in filling the gap, the huge gap of, of, of the Syrian need right now. Now we have almost 25 minutes. Uh, we'll, we got some questions uh, from uh, the audience and I have uh, some questions for uh, all of you. We'll start with you, um, Mazin. Uh, Mona mentioned, uh, of course, uh, everyone now following uh, Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. Myself, I never expected uh, or predicted that he would do that, despite of uh, 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 the U.S. intelligence being warning everyone of, of, of the potential of such operation. But Putin is unpredictable. Um, and this is why I make the, the Syrian conflict, it's a uh, three layers conflict. One of the layers, of course, is internationalized conflict, which you need a compromise between Russia and the United States, because both they have troops on the ground. Uh, and we have a deadlock at the Security Council if Russia uh, insists of using a, a veto on any kind of resolution uh, related to the humanitarian assistance, uh, especially 
and we got down from three cross boarding into one for, for a one year and will end in July. What's the alternative plan? If the, is there a, a plan B, P for the Syrian civil society or for the international community? We heard a lot on that, uh, but I doubt of such thing. It will be um, uh, and an early discussion, of course, we still have four or five months, but it's worth doing, especially of uh, Putin's decision yesterday. What's your take on that, Mazen? Uh, thank you, Rodon, for this question. Uh, frankly, it's a current question since five, four, five years. We, uh, we every year uh, start this question after the renewal and end it at the at the next renewal. So, uh, and uh, in the last uh, uh, two years, you know, we we are doing that uh, every six months. Um, now, frankly, uh, the UN is keep talking that there is no plan B to give uh, to to not to avoid give the impression that there is a plan B. But frankly, we are preparing for plan B with the all 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 humanitarian uh, actors, including UN, uh, uh, Syrian NGOs, uh, and and international NGOs, um, uh, since since long time. Uh, unfortunately, many of UN agencies will be pulled out. Uh, of, of Syria and will not continue doing uh, 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 programs or delivering uh, 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 any kind of humanitarian aid through the borders. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we, as I mentioned in my, in my uh, remarks, uh, uh, we need more, frankly, from the donors, from the, uh, the, the, the big supporters for the humanitarian uh, uh, cause in Syria, we need more pressure in some UN agencies to continue doing their, their role without cross-border resolution because some of UN, the other UN agencies are, uh, will continue. They, they say that we will continue, will not stop like IOM. So, so IOM will continue. Some other uh, uh, UN agencies will do different things uh, without crossing the borders, but maybe will support the, the, the funding for some, some uh, actors on, on the ground. Uh, and we believe that there is a, a legal sol solution for, for, for that, uh, despite that there is a, 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 a position, that, that the official position of UN that they, will, uh, they cannot do that, but, but the reality says that some of UN agencies Will, will continue and they announced that. So this is the, the first one. The second one, we uh, worked uh, with the uh, sub, uh, donors and supporters of the uh, SCHF, Syria Cross-Border Humanitarian Fund, which is uh, led by OCHA to create INSAF. INSAF is the alternative uh, pool fund led by FCDO uh, and will continue collecting the don donations from the, 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 the same donors uh, uh, of the SCHF and will uh, have different uh, uh, maybe management so, uh, led by, by the donors themselves to continue supporting the, uh, the, the uh, NGOs and the uh, actors on the ground to uh, uh, let me say, instead of the SCHF. This could be also a, a, a step for forward and uh, as an alternative. The third thing that we, uh, and with donors, we are doing our best nowadays and since one year to, 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 uh, to, to increase the capacity of the uh, international NGOs to be the alternative of uh, the uh, pulled out UN agencies if there will be no renewal for the cross-border resolution. So the donors will, uh, will uh, give the same, almost the, the fund allocated for Syria uh, to the NGOs, uh, 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 which will not be able to be de delivered to UN agencies. Those NGOs for sure will be international NGOs, big NGOs, and those will, will provide the actors and the, the, the Syrian NGOs on the ground with this fund to be continued. Unfortunately, uh, there is no cap capacity of INGOs to absorb all the fund. 
because of many, many things, uh, especially the supply chain and the uh, uh, food, uh, medications, medical supplies. So there will be a, a problem in that. And we are not optimistic about the cross line at all. So we, uh, as you all know, Russia and the Syrian government uh, pushing for cross line more and more, uh, but uh, it's very, very clear. And we have very clear vision that the cross line will not be as an alternative. So in general, uh, those are things we are uh, doing as the humanitarian actors. And we are planning that with, uh, with, the, with the donors. How much we will cover? Uh, it's not clear for me. I think it's very difficult to be re replaced uh, for food, for example. 75% is provided by World Food Program. So 75% uh, it's, uh, 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 is very huge amount of, uh, of food uh, uh, needs in Northwest Syria. So uh, this is very difficult to be delivered to any INGO or to many INGOs. So, uh, and the cross sign will, will not be sufficient. Maybe for health, there will be some uh, better, better uh, situation uh, because we are not just getting 45% from our needs from UN. So 55% is already provided by NGOs, by ourselves, but the 45 will be delivered to, uh, to, to the NGOs. Maybe there will be a shortage, but not like the situation in, in food. Excellent, thank you, Mazin. Uh, Muna, um, I have a question here. Um, what, um, will all the sanctions that are being imposed on Russia, will Putin be able to maintain the same level of economic support to the Assad regime? And then also I have one more question. Um, you mentioned, of course, Syria is not top priority for the, Oba uh, for the Biden administration. Uh, do you think this is will change uh, if after the Russians invade of Ukraine and see Syria as maybe a hot spot, can uh, weaken Russian position there, uh, or uh, still the Biden uh, the Biden administration very domestic oriented, focusing on uh, recovery and uh, pro after COVID uh, era. Thanks, Radwan. Look, I think it's still very early days to think through what are the implications of Russia's now war in Ukraine for its posture in Syria. But let's be clear, we know that Russia has not provided significant economic assistance to the Assad regime. Their, their support has been military in nature. Um, and, uh, and indeed, I think part of their plan, which is I don't see it at all going forward, was to rely on reconstruction, was to rely on the international community somehow um, wearing its, itself down and allowing for the reintegration of the Assad regime. I don't think, of course, that's not going to be successful. In other words, but I don't think that you're going to see a significant shift economically because they weren't providing much to begin with. Um, we'll have to see what it means militarily. We'll have to see where things go. I think it's it's early days on that. In terms of the Biden administration, you know, I unfortunately, I do not see Syria uh, coming back up to the top of the list of priorities. On the contrary, I think that as the administration finds itself stretched with what's happening in Ukraine, with, you know, concerns, frankly, about China and what goes on there, um, and of course, all of the issues at home, and let's not forget, we're in now an election year. I don't see Syria somehow reclaiming a, a position of a, of a top priority. For that reason, I'd like to just once again underscore um, the importance of trying to think through creatively. And let me applaud Lena for her really inspiring stories. It reminds me of the work I did at AID, working with refugees and host communities and trying to find those creative solutions, which are out there. Um, and I love the idea of we provide skills, not solutions. I think that's exactly right. I think it's really is about building resilience and your focus, Lena, on, on youth and children is key because they are, of course, the next generation. They are the, they are the future. So I think we really need to turn our energies toward though, that kind of thinking. And I just wanna push back a little bit on Karam's um, characterization of early recovery. Early recovery has been 
present as a potential intervention all along. It was absolutely highlighted in the uh, UN Security Council, Council Resolution 2585, but that's not the first time um, that it has been on the table as an important tool. And frankly, in any conflict, regardless of what's happening, as we've all noted, the, the conflict is entering its 12th year. It is untenable to continue to treat Syria as a humanitarian emergency. It is untenable to have to truck water in. The food security issues that, that you have outlined and that I've noted, the solutions, and, and actually Mazin's point about WFP and the, and the amount of food that is, is, is you know, dependent on WFP. And honestly, I'm quite worried about, I don't think there's a good solution if uh, the cross border uh, crossing at, at Babel Hawa is not renewed. So let's depoliticize to the extent that we can early recovery. Let's try to understand it. It is not reconstruction. Um, I don't see it tied to any sort of negotiation. The, the situation is stalemated. I mean, that, the sad, painful truth is it is stalemated and Assad is there. And so how to assuage the suffering of Syrians in a time of diminishing uh, donor funding and interest in Syria. And this is where I think early recovery is important because it works at the local level. It begins to build resilience in communities. It begins to get at many of the questions Lena has addressed. And it's not about reconstructing. It's about maybe refurbishing schools, refurbishing health facilities, which is critical uh, at this time when, as we are all noting, the level of humanitarian suffering is at an all time high in Syria. So I, I would sort of urge all of us and those that are that are participating in this webinar to really put your energies toward thinking more creatively about what, what does early recovery look like going forward? How do we harness um, the diaspora? Um, how do we think through more creatively ways to um, encourage, frankly, economic activities, encourage drought resistant crops, what, whatever, the, whatever the various interventions are. But I think the looming potential closure of Babel Hawa actually underscores just how important it is to start thinking about longer term solutions in Syria, as difficult as, difficult as it is. And one final point on sanctions, uh, there's no discussion, as I'm aware, of any lifting of targeted sanctions, of any lifting of sanctions on reconstruction, of any lifting of sanctions that uh, are seeking to directly impact the Assad regime, uh, Assad, the cronies around him, or reconstruction funding flowing into Syria. No discussion of that. The questions are really these unintended humanitarian impacts that we, I think we all are agreeing are having an adverse impact on Syrian civilians. For me, the biggest conundrum, and I don't know the answer to this, is the issue of the banking system. Syria is effectively almost cut off now entirely from the international banking system. And yet remittances are the lifeline for so many Syrians. And so what, what is the solution? How to facilitate money go, going to directly to families inside Syria who are so in need um, in the face of uh, these sort of, you know, these sanctions that are, are covering just about every aspect of life. To me, those are the challenges. I'm not going to pretend to have answers. I don't. But I think we need to think long and hard. And I think we should be, be, be careful not to, not to apply too broad a brush and really think in a more nuanced way about the situation on the ground in Syria and, and how, to, how to help those in need. Thanks. Oh, th th thank you, Mona. Um, I think none of us even touch base the issue of investing more capital in the political transition because looks all of us they gave up on 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 this issue. But I need to link at the Security Council Resolution twenty two fifty four into what Karam you talked about the role of the UN mission. Uh, it's very important to reevaluate the UN mission in Syria. Uh, we always talk about lessons learned or best practices, but always we come up to the failure of the UN in, in any conflict and in, in the case of, of, of Syria. There was a perception from the Syrian 
government in 2011, 2012 to reject any involvement of the UN. This is why the UN mission in Syria kept it small and kept it focused only on the humanitarian aspect. The need of the humanitarian uh, assistant increased and the mission of the UN became only the distribution of the UN uh, assistance within the Syria regime. The UN never used this assistant into to privilege uh, uh, moving forward in the, in, in, in the political transition as example. And this is why the Syria regime 12 years on succeed to keep the UN mission into only humanitarian assistance inside Syria and not to privilege uh, th those assistance to have some gain on the political transition. And I need to your opinion, Karam, into this issue because we see the UN as example in East Timor and in other nations like in Iraq, they moved forward a little bit and they kept the linkage between the humanitarian assistance and the political transition. Is there now a need to reevaluate the UN mission in Syria and think more about what the UN they can do uh, because of lack of interest, uh, especially in, in, in the international uh, 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 factor or st stakeholders in the case of Syria? Well, I mean, first, let me just um, respond to what Mona said regarding early recovery. Um, we never said it's actually something that uh, appeared out of the blue. In fact, it's written in uh, our publication two weeks ago. Uh, it's just that that cluster was actually 6.9% funded, as we mentioned in the briefing. So in other words, it, there was a lot of talk about it. There was no action on it little action on it. Now the talk uh, around early recovery has renewed and now there is um, more pressure to, to get it going. Uh, and obviously, as I said, I really don't know what the answer is. I think it's a dilemma. Uh, I don't know if it's actually a good idea to increase early aid recovery at this stage. And as to whether it's actually reconstruction aid or not, we saw those differences between the representatives of Jordan and France in the latest uh, conference in Brussels, where actually Jordan was interpreting early recovery as reconstruction. Um, and there was a pushback from France that no, it's it, it can't be used for building um, infrastructure and so on. So uh, I think we can all see a way where this type of aid uh, can be misused. Um, and perhaps if it's going to happen, then we need to just make sure it's, it's going to be spent properly. And with all evidence that we're seeing before, I think it's I mean, it's fair enough for us to be skeptical or to, to ask the UN to uh, make sure the money is spent uh, properly. Now, regarding the UN role in Syria in, in general, um, 2254 is becoming more of like wishful thinking. Uh, we, can, we can all see that. However, I also think we as people interested in the prosperity of Syria in the long term, we should never reach a point where we say, uh, we, we give up, we have to think of a new arrangement because any other arrangement that does not address the, raw, the root causes of the conflict will actually result in, in continued instability. Do we want a settlement like the one in Taif in, in uh, Lebanon that ended the civil war that lasted for 15 years by just making all warlords happy? They put money into the pockets of those <laughs> landlords and that just tweaked the confessional um, based power sharing system. Um, and look at Lebanon now. I think I understand it's becoming less and less likely for that resolution to be to form the basis of uh, ending the, the conflict in Syria, but I think we should all continue to push for it. Thank you, Karam. Uh, Lena, uh, I have a question here regarding that. Uh, bec the, the humanitarian uh, need uh, if the, the situation continue and it will continue unfortunately with the low, uh, lowest priority 
and too many things happened Ukraine, uh, 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 Iran uh, negotiations, and in all of that, does the Syrian civil society will be able to fill uh, the gap of, of, of the need? I mean, of course, uh, your organization, other organization doing an amazing job, but still when we talk about millions of millions of, of, of children, um, it became, it became of course very difficult uh, to expect uh, a generation of, an educated generation of Syrians who be able to do any of recovery or reconstruction on the future. I mean, the photos and the pictures we are talking uh, on, on the displays. And, and unfortunately, those are not refugees because are not crossing the border into Turkey and Turkey closed the, the border. And those 3 million are unable also to go back to there because uh, they have a safety and security concern. And we see the conditions there. Um, it became, it became, it's one of the hardest photos ever, every Syrian seen. Mm -hmm. And now we are in the 11 years. What, what, what the international community should do, especially yeah. on, 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 on the case of, 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 of those? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I think, I think a lot about this question. I've been thinking about this question for many years. And I think, I don't know if this is general across the board for Syrians, but I know a lot of Syrians who are my friends in this space we grapple a lot with um, kind of like just even what's going on, like what Muna is bringing up versus what Karam is responding is that we have this, and there's a little, almost a sense of shame, but also a sense of knowledge at the same time of, we know we can't fix the problem alone because the problem is much bigger than ourselves. But at the same time, we are seeing time and time again solutions coming from civil society that all, that prove that we actually know how to do a lot. Like if we look at the example of the white helmets, if we look at, there's so many examples. And I wanted to just ask Muna, I have so much respect for all of your work. Um, I, it's just that this this part about unintended and um, unintended. Um, what is it? Unintended int intentions? What was the phrase? Or implications? Just effects of, the, effects of the sanctions that are were not intended in terms of harming Syrian civilians. But I just think that 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 it's there's so much of what happened in Syria that we can call unintended that became intended, whether we like it or not. So, for instance, for me, the problem with the U UNHCR functioning inside Syria and coming in after the fact, which we've seen time and time again, saying we're rebuilding schools in Dara, we're rebuilding schools in Hamas, but they will. I'm all for rebuilding schools all across Syria, no matter what what area this is in, because at the end of the day, Syrian kids need schools. But I just wish that there was just an ounce of accountability, just in even if it's in the communication side to say we're rebuilding schools that were destroyed by the Assad Air Forces. It, but they can't even say what happened. And I think this is where so much of the pain of Syrians lie is that even what happened is taken away from us. Even what to saying the truth of, of, of what we where we are is taken away. Um, and so like I see that that's if there was just some of that happening, I think that Syrians would be much more open to the fact of whatever the UN can do or UN agencies can do that obviously civil society cannot. And the other piece that I want to talk about is one part, one, another example that was, has been on my mind so much in the past few months is just the idea of every single year since the crisis began, um, there's a phenomenon that happens around December and suddenly we're in an emergency situation because winter came. Winter came and the snow came and destroys all of the tents in Lebanon and in Syria in the IDP camps. And now we're in this in this crazy situation of all of the agencies fundraising because we need to save the Syrians and save them from the weather that happens every single 12 months. And there's and what we do is what what, what are we trying to do? Rebuild the, the tents we, and, and continue to have people live in these situations that we know are unlivable year after year after year. And what we, did we see? And, the, and this year, one um, moment of bright hope was when the organization, the Mulham team, 
created a campaign and they called it Until the Last Tent. And what are they doing? They're fundraising to replace every tent with a shelter. And then when I see these kinds of initiatives, they were able to raise, I think, $2 million within a couple of weeks, which is really difficult to do in this climate, and doing it all through crowdfunding, and actually rebuilt, I think they have 500 or 1,000 shelters at this point that they're building, and they're showing people that they're doing it. When I see that, I think, why can't the large agencies partner and do this? This is something. So we do know what we need. We are people, and we know what we need. And we need it at a scale that we cannot provide on our own. But I wish that um, international organizations and the international community would partner up with these kinds of solutions. And I think it's coming from the point, if we want to go back to the essence of this whole conversation, which is, and it's so relatable to what's happening right now in Ukraine, is we have to think exactly what it means, what humanitarian intervention really means. And until governments are actually willing to face that difficult term that has had so much bad, um, bad, um, a bad legacy of all of the times that this has happened, not in the in the for the interests of the people, but really what is humanitarian, humanitarian intervention, which is intervening for the interests of the people. And I think that's where the UN needs to be focused on and where governments need to be focused on, because that's what's needed right now. Thank you, Lena. Thank you. Uh, now we come up with the time. Um, I just mentioned one number, which Lena uh, talked about. We have 1,300 IDB camps on the border. Uh, it's uh, uh, mind blowing to see uh, that even number is increasing of, of, of the IDB uh, people there, leaving their houses, homes, and just living the, 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 the tents. Um, the, the, the need, of course, beyond our imagination, and this is, I think, it's this panel just try to to shed a small light on on on, on the need. Uh, thank you all. We have a fantastic panel. Uh, thank you, Mona, Lina, uh, Karam, and Mazin, for your insight and your remarks. And uh, hopefully, that we be able uh, um, at least to have a discussion. Uh, within here in Washington DC and other policymakers uh, uh, to make at least uh, the life even one Syrian better that would be good. Thank you very much.